Hey guys and gals, Salim Rezai here, and today we're going to be talking about a poll I put out about how you manage DKA, whether you would choose sub-Q insulin or whether you just continue to use traditional IV uh, insulin in the management of DKA. And here's the poll I put out there. You have an adult patient with mild to moderate DKA, which we define as a glucose greater than 300, a pH that's over 7, and a bicarb that's greater than 10. Which type of insulin would you use at your institution? And by far and away, both on X and on YouTube, IV insulin infusion was the number one answer in over 80% of your responses. Um, there were some people that said sub-Q insulin, and I suspect that there are some patients where we do try and do that. But I suspect the reason for this question is based on this recent publication that's just been hitting all the social media waves, which is the SQUID protocol, which stands for Subcutaneous Insulin and Diabetic Ketoacidosis, published in Academic Emergency Medicine 2023. I have the PMID number there for you if you want to look at their protocol uh, for yourself. But the clinical question the authors were trying to answer is, in adult patients with mild to moderate DKA, does a subcutaneous insulin protocol reduce ED length of stay compared to a traditional IV infusion uh, DKA protocol? And here's what they did. So this was a before and after study. So there was pre-intervention, which I'll talk about in just a second. And then there was implementation of their SQUID protocol, which would be the after. And then they also looked at some historical controls. This was single center, so it's only one institution. So this may not generalize to a lot of places that we all work at. And although the study was prospectively done, they retrospectively went back to pull all the data. And what they ended up with were 78 patients that ended up in this SQUID protocol, the sub-Q insulin protocol, 99 patients in their traditional kind of DKA protocols that we all use with IV insulin infusion. And then they had two historical controls. They had a, a pre-intervention, so before implementation of this, that went from November of 2020 to May of 2021. And then they also had a pre-COVID just to make sure, because this took place during the height of COVID, that there was no like kind of confounders here between the two that went from August 2019 to February of 2020. I'll explain that a little bit more as we go on. Um, this is their protocol. And it's a lot of small print, and it's not for you to read it and memorize it and write it down. You can pull it from the paper. I'll have a blog post out on Rebel EM that will kind of have this table for you. But this looks just as complicated as the IV infusion as far as I'm concerned in terms of like the number of things we're checking and how we're having to do it. It doesn't seem like this is just like a sub-Q shot and then we're like moving on. This seems just as complicated, and that's the reason I have this picture up. Now, the outcomes the authors were looking at were fidelity, safety, and operational outcomes. And so for fidelity, it was, what was the frequency of required Q2 hour glucose checks, which in their protocol, they're supposed to be checking glucose every two hours. What about safety, the proportion of patients that ended up having to get some kind of rescue dextrose for hypoglycemia? And then operational, their primary outcome was ED length of stay, but also they looked at... Um, uh, ICU admission rate. So who was included? These were adult patients meeting criteria for mild to moderate DKA. So they had hyperglycemia, blood glucose greater than 300 milligrams per deciliter, positive ketones greater than or equal to 1.1 millimoles per liter, and an anion gap present. I actually redid the table that was in the paper, and the way they defined mild to moderate was plasma glucose greater than 300, a pH that was 7.0 or greater, and then a bicarb that was 10 or greater. So if you had a pH of less than 7 or a bicarb of less than 10, you were considered severe and not included in the, in the trial. So let's look at fidelity, the frequency of Q2 hour glucose checks. Well, in the SQUID protocol, they were having to check glucose once every hour, um, not even the two hours that they were looking at. The traditional was also once every hour. And when they compare that to their historical controls, so before they implemented their SQUID protocol and before COVID really kind of took off, basically across the board, there was no change in all of the different protocols, pre-intervention, pre-COVID, SQUID um, versus IV insulin infusion. 
they were having to check glucose once every hour. And so this doesn't really make the life of a nurse or the management of these patients any easier based on this outcome, not their primary outcome, but just wanted to bring that up. Now, what about uh, the need for rescue dextrose for hypoglycemia? Well, the squid protocol was 2.7%. Traditional DKA protocol was 3.6%. And when they compared that to before they included this intervention and before COVID, what you can see is that the frequency of hypoglycemia increased by 0.4% um, with the uh, initiation of squid protocol, and it increased by 2.7% um, compared to before COVID. Now, this wasn't statistically significant, but numerically, the frequency of hypoglycemia still increased. Now, this was their primary outcome, operational impact ED length of stay. And sure enough, the SQUID protocol dropped it down from 8.9 hours from 11.9 hours in the traditional kind of uh, insulin DKA protocol. And compared to the pre-intervention, so before they implemented this, it decreased it by 1.4 hours. And then before COVID, it decreased it by 3.6 hours. So yes, it's true. It's statistically significant. It decreased ED length of stay. But really what we're talking about is the length of stay was decreased by 1.4 to 3.6 hours, which is not that much time. And I know all time matters, but this isn't like we cut it down by like half a day or by a full day, or we limited admission to the hospital. I mean, we're just talking a few hours here. So when we talk about the operational impact in terms of ICU admissions, you can see that uh, for whatever reason, we got squid and traditional protocol lumped together instead of separately. I would have loved to see them separate, but the need for ICU admission was 42.9%. Pre-intervention, so before they implemented squid protocol was 46%, and then pre-COVID was 49.1%. And so what we see is we see a decrease in the need for ICU admission but again, only by 3.1% in the pre-intervention, so the before-after, and then the pre-COVID was 6.2%. Not statistically significant, but numerically, we do see a decrease in ICU admissions. And I think with how rare those beds are, any decrease is a decrease. All right, so now my two cents on this squid protocol that I've seen all over social media and everyone talking about, like, we should be switching over to sub-Q insulin, which... Look, I'm all for trying to make things easier, but you saw the protocol. I don't think it's easy. And that was very evident in even the author's comments. If you implement a squid protocol at your institution, it's going to require significant hospital-wide education, nurses, techs, hospitalists, intensivists, uh, ED staff. I mean, this is going to require like a lot of education and here they even say it in their in their um, paper and I wrote it down for you several patients got misclassified who actually had severe DKA so they had severe DKA and should have been started on an IV insulin DKA infusion and instead they got started on the sub Q squid protocol there were a few cases of underdosing or delayed insulin and so Basically, these patients ended up suffering recurrent hyperglycemia or recurrent DKA. There was just, they took too long to give them the long-acting insulin to transition them. And then failure to initiate dextrose-containing fluids in a timely fashion with this protocol, and they ended up with a lot more uh, events of hypoglycemia, which we kind of went through when we went through all the results. Frequency of glucose checks. You know, <laughs> the median was one hour. Um, and we're talking the range from 0.8 to 1.1 checks uh, per hour. And is that feasible in a busy ED? Is that feasible on medical floors? And I don't think it is. Like, I think it's actually kind of dangerous and probably why they had more hypoglycemic events is we just can't keep up with this. And so this would still require an ICU level of care. So is it really decreasing things the way the authors had hoped? Hypoglycemia, secondary outcome, trial not powered for it, but compared to historical controls, we saw way more hypoglycemia events, and so they were increased. And so, again, that has to do with how rigorous this protocol is. It's not necessarily easier, although sub-Q does sound easier. For the ICU admits, I already kind of alluded to this. Why don't we have the data for how many of the squid protocol patients ended up needing ICU and how many of the traditional patients needed to go to the ICU? Instead, they kind of lumped the two together. And so I don't know, did squid protocol actually decrease it? We don't have that information. 
Bottom line for me is for adult patients with mild to moderate DKA, the squid protocol, which is sub-Q insulin, has the potential to be an alternative treatment to decrease ED length of stay. And I think there will be some mild DKA patients where this is actually very feasible. But this single center trial before and after study, ED length of stay was only decreased by three hours. I don't know that that has going to be clinically impactful. ICU admission rate only decreased by three to six percent. And I understand that ICU beds are really rare, but three to six percent just doesn't seem like that much to me. Is it feasible to check glucoses every hour in the ED with how busy we are and on the medical floors? Doesn't seem like it to me from a practicality standpoint. And then hypoglycemia events seem to increase as well because of how rigorous this protocol was and delays in starting things. And that got almost up to 3%. So for me, there might be the rare mild DKA patient where a squid protocol or sub-Q insulin seems very valid. But SQUID protocol kind of elaborated and generalized to multiple different institutions and multiple different areas of care is not ready for prime time. That is my two cents on this. And I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments, and questions on it. Because again, it seems like most people agree that IV insulin is the way to go. But there were still almost 20% of people who said sub-Q insulin would be something that they would do. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you for tuning in. And until next time.